we want this to be scary. We know why, but we don't want it to be um, like exploitive. Like we don't want to just show images that are or gory or, or that disturbing just to show them like they have to, you know, it has to further the narrative. It has to further the understanding of what's happening. James, how are you, sir? I'm well, I'm well. Nice to meet you. I, I noticed by your articles, you're into wrestling and I just did a wrestling series. <laughs> oh yeah. I am huge into wrestling. Did you really yeah, do? Yeah. So? Oh yeah. Um, I did the Teddy Hart series about. Um, I know all about Teddy Hart. I know yeah. all about Teddy Hart and his lineage. <laughs> Listen, someday we will talk about that because I want to deep dive <laughs> yeah. on Teddy Hart here because I know his, yeah. his, his interesting history with CM Punk, but I think it's, yeah. a, it's a lot of fun to explore. But I got to ask you, how did you yeah. come across the idea of creating a docuseries about Ed Gein? Because I literally, I promised myself I was going to watch two episodes last night and two this morning. I ended up watching the whole thing last night. It is phenomenal. Right. Um, I appreciate it. Thank how you. did you come across this idea to, to, to really expand this docuseries? Well, it all started with the tapes. Um, the the tapes were recorded uh, in real time in 1957 um, by by a judge. He put them in his uh, home safe. Those made the tapes made their way into a safety deposit box where they sat for decades. Um, and after the judge had died, his family um, said, "You know, we got to do something with these." So they approached uh, the executive producer of the series, Josh Canoe, and and his partner uh, Jill Howerton. And we we had mutual friends and and they they reached out to me and I was like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> and the three of us just, you know, were like, we got to do something really special with that. And that's the rest is history. That's where it started. When you first heard the tapes yourself, what was your first reaction? The first time I actually got the tapes it was right before Christmas. So we always in, in entertainment, we always take like a two week break over Christmas where the whole industry basically shuts down. So I. I got the tapes and then we had this two week break. So I spent, I had two weeks with nothing to do. Um, so I, it was two weeks of me and Ed just like listening to the tapes. They hadn't, they, they were just raw. They hadn't been transcribed or anything. So I was like filtering them, putting through the, you know, putting them through different plugins myself, like trying to decipher what he was saying. And, and it took me two weeks. And then I, I was rereading the books and it was like, it was like the best Christmas ever because I just got to do nothing but, you know, learn about Ed Gein for two weeks. <laughs> so I was super excited. Can you talk to me? Because one thing I found really fascinating about this documentary, and it's kind of explored in the Psycho movie, is uh, Ed Gein's relationship with his mother, Augusta. Can you talk about that relationship yeah. a little bit and how that kind of forms Ed as we see him throughout the rest of the docuseries? Ed Gein um, was raised by an alcoholic father and a fanatical mother. Um, his father died, um, uh, basically of alcoholism. I, I believe he was in his mid forties. He's, he was quite young. And so Ed was kind of left alone, um, with this, um, uh, mother who was a religious fanatic. Um, she, um, was from a town, uh, not far away from, uh, where Ed was raised. Uh, they moved to uh, Plainfield. Um, and, and Ed was, we actually went out to Ed's farmhouse or where it is today. And right. it's this really isolated plot of land. It's in the middle of nowhere. So Ed spent his entire adolescence, young adulthood, even into adulthood, sitting in this isolated farmhouse with his mother, who would just preach about the sins of the world and how men are evil and sex is bad and women are evil. And she sees evil, evil, evil all around him. And he, he, he not only internalized this, but he came to worship his mother, to become obsessed with her um, to the point where he physically and uh, like almost literally wanted to become his mother. Right. And, and that really kind of laid the bedrock to what he later became. Now, there's something extra chilling about an unassuming person that could be the person next door uh, doing all these uh, horrendous crimes. Before making this docuseries, what was your... Uh, relationship or understanding about Ed Gein. I mean, I was really familiar with Ed Gein before the docu series. I'm, I, I studied, you know, serial killers in college. I, I've, I've been uh, fascinated with true crime and serial killers in you know, my whole adult life, <laughs> going back to high school. So, so I was, I knew who Ed Gein was for sure. Um, but when the tapes came, I mean, to hear his voice, it was like next level. I mean, I, I never. Ex you know, I, I've never even, I think the only video of Ed Gein, which we recovered is, you know, seconds long, you know, right. there's, there's very, very little, basically him walking into the courthouse or walking out of the police station. That's, that's all they have. No recording um, has ever been found publicly. Anyway, there's like wow. rumors, but so 
just to hear him was incredible. It was it was uh, so fascinating. Something I really found fascinating about this, too, was Ed Ginn believed he had the power to resurrect his mother. Um, yeah. Now, uh, Plainfield won't exhume the body. But do you think, in your opinion, that he attempted or or, or got his mother's corpse uh, at all? Yeah, I have no. I mean, that's it's a super interesting question. So they the Plainfield Cemetery, which we went to and filmed at. Mm-hmm. Um, is owned by um, the town. The town of Plainfield is is not actually a town. I mean, it's not like an incorporated town. But we we went out and and saw the graves for ourselves and saw the saw the things. I mean, we the answer is we don't know. We don't know if he dug up his mother. One thing that's really interesting is when you actually go out and stand on his mother's grave, which we did. The first body he exhumed is is the next one over. Oh, wow. So to me. The, it, that suggests that he um, either tried to get to his mother, couldn't, and then just moved to one over, um, or he exhumed his mother first and then continued on. Um, the reason he, he, the reason people believe he didn't exhume his mother, is because he said that I tried, but this, but the uh, you know the dirt kept falling in on me. He he was like unable to get to her. He said she was in some sort of crypt, and he kind of had all these excuses. The problem is, is that the, the first gate grave he exhumed is right next to his mother. So if he had the problems uh, at the grave site of his mother, he would have the same problems at the grave site next to her. Right. So, so, I mean, in my opinion, I definitely think he exhumed his mother. I think if you dug that grave up, there'd be nothing there. Um, the town is really reluctant to revisit the story. Um, but, uh, but and so, you know, until that changes, we'll never know. Now, I actually want to talk about the town for a second because some of the relatives from the people either involved in the investigation or the victims still live in that town. Um, can you talk about the vibe of that town? And uh, if I don't know if if there's uh, if they've kind of if, if, if that if Ed Gein's kind of um, horrendous crimes still linger over that town at all? Yeah, the answer is they do for sure. Uh, we we spent a lot of time in Plainfield. Um, it's hard to go to Plainfield and not you know, encounter the story, even unwillingly. Like I remember we were, we were having lunch. There's this beautiful, actually in the middle of it, middle of Plainfield, there's there's not much in Plainfield, but in the middle of Plainfield, there's this really beautiful um, cafe, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> you know, we're eating lunch there. And as we're eating, you can see people pull up and get out of cars and then walk around uh, making YouTube videos, like uh, um, all around the town. Um, so, so, it, you know, the story is, is is very present in Plainfield. You know, I don't know that there are, um, you know, any any descendants of the victims are kind of great, great, great grandchildren at this point. Um, you know, the victims were elderly in 1957. Um, so so I don't know that there's anyone in the town um, that that is a direct um, relationship to the victims anymore. But you know, the wounds are still fresh. And, and, and I think it's incredibly, uh, it's admirable that the town has been so resilient over the years, you know, in spite of this, you know, fighting back, trying to, trying to ensure that this doesn't define the town, although, you know, it sadly does. I think this uh, docuseries is brilliant. And um, I mean, it is very disturbing with some of the images that are there. And I can't imagine that there was uh, anything that wasn't shown, but was there anything that was too intense or a story that was too intense? that didn't quite make the cut that you kind of wish was included or is everything Um, there? I think everything's there. (laughs) You know, it, it, we didn't hold back. Um, You know, we, we chose to tell, we chose to make it scary on purpose. We chose horror as the medium by which to tell this story, because that's how people have processed the Ed Gaines story or the years. So it was a very, it was a very deliberate choice. We, we set out to make it really scary. We, We set out to be like, Hey, let's do something different. Let's do a documentary. That's also a horror movie. Um, um, so that's all very purposeful. You know, there there isn't there was always discussions of like, you know, like like any project, there's always discussions of like, you know, should we show this here? Should we show this over here? You know, what's the most impactful? You know, and and we were always very conscious of saying we want this to be scary. We know why, but we don't want it to be um, like exploitive. Like we don't want to just show images that are or gory or, or that disturbing just to show them like they have to, you know, it has to 
further the narrative. It has to further the understanding of what's happening. You know, one thing I also love about this documentary is that we dive into how society reacted to it uh, yeah. with the making of films like Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This almost feels like a, a mini documentary about those films as well. Uh, yeah. Because watching those films like Psycho or Texas Chainsaw Massacre, after doing this project, does it change your perspective or your relationship with those with those films? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I am a, of, of those movies. Um, I, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favorite by far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like that, and you know, ha- having nothing to do with Egin, uh, You know, I remember seeing Texas Chainsaw Massacre and thinking like, this is a masterpiece. Like th- this is incredible. And you can watch that movie today, and it is it is still it's a it's like the scariest horror movie out there. It's scarier I, than The Exorcist. Scarier than Psycho. Like it, it's terrifying movie. Um, it, it's still it almost has aged better because it like looks realer. Now, you know, in a way, it looks like more real. Realer is probably not a word, but (laughs) (laughs) it looks more, more real now. Um, So, yeah, I think in terms of changing my relationship to those movies, I think what people don't understand is that you can there's a direct line between Ed Gein and Psycho that go that continues to this day. You know, it's Ed Gein and then Psycho and then Texas Chainsaw Massacre and then Silence of the Lambs and then, you know, the Ed Gein remakes and then the Rob Zombie movies. And then, you know, you can that kind of influence has continues to to even movies that are coming out this year and it will continue for the next hundred years, probably. Well, look, James, the docuseries is incredible. Uh, I literally, you, you did a good job of making it a docuseries and a horror series because I, <laughs> after I had to go to the bathroom, I had all the lights on just to make sure <laughs> that it was going to come up my stairs. But fantastic job. I, I, I love it. And I can't wait to talk to you about Teddy Hart. I would love it's to talk nice. to you about that. 